America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world. And no one will keep that light from shining. Today, our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature. And we responded with the best of America, with the daring of our rescue workers, with the caring of, for strangers and neighbors who came to give blood and help in any way they could. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. America has stood down any enemies before, and we will do so this time. None of us will ever forget this day. Yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. Thank you. Good night. And God bless America. George Bush speaking earlier today to the American people. We won't know the final toll of dead and injured for days, but it's clear it will run into many thousands. Many more than died at Pearl Harbor, possibly more than were killed and wounded in any single battle of America's bloody civil war. The Bush administration and the entire nation will now be asking how the richest and most sophisticated society on earth could prove so vulnerable. Why did its massive security apparatus apparently fail to pick up any warnings? I talked earlier today to counter-terrorism expert Dr Neil Livingston in Washington. Neil Livingston, what light can you shed on what it would have taken to put these attacks together and carry them out? Well, this has been our worst nightmare for many years, and that is a, a coordinated series of attacks against high-consequence targets in this country. Uh, it wasn't a question of if it would happen, it was only a question of when it would happen. And so as a consequence, uh, we've given this a lot of thought in the past, uh, and we know that it would take a great deal of money, uh, logistics capability, uh, reasonable intelligence, uh, excellent coordination. And so there are only a few terrorist groups in the world that could mount that kind of attack, and perhaps a couple of countries. Who are the obvious suspects? Well, all of the prime suspects, according to our friends in the law enforcement and intelligence community right now, are in the Middle East. And Osama bin Laden certainly heads the list of, uh, of uh, suspects in terms of terrorist uh, groups and organizations but also some concern about some Palestinian groups and uh, groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad, but all Islamicist type of groups. Uh, on the other side of the equation on state sponsors, it has not gone unnoticed, of course, that 10 years ago the United States uh, was engaged in uh, what was the run-up to a conflict with Saddam Hussein and that was George W. Bush's father. And uh, so there has always been a sense that Iraq would pick its time and place and at some point might strike back at us. The connection between these attacks and the sentencing today of the original bomber of the World Trade Center seems unavoidable. Well, there certainly is coincidence at the very least in that regard, and it may have been marked. Uh, but I, I would say that the terrorists may have uh, not pick this day especially, but rather this time period. In other words, these attacks might originally have been intended even for another day. Absolutely, and been prepared to do it tomorrow if they couldn't do it today. What does this say about America's capacity to defend itself against this type of attack? Our airport security is not as good as it should be. We have the only airport security system in the world of a, uh, that a major country has that is not totally federalized. Uh, it is the responsibility in many cases of, uh, of the airlines themselves and of the, uh, of the local uh, 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 airport authorities. And that's a system that's broken and needs to be fixed. How likely is it that there are other targets? What we're concerned about right now is that there may be a, a B team, a C team, a D team, either preparing in some other part of the world for terrorist strikes tomorrow or the next day or next week, war against other cities in the United States. How on earth does America or any other country prepare for that? Well, I think that right now it's going to take a coordinated effort by all of the like-minded countries um, to take the appropriate steps to essentially destroy the terrorists and their state sponsors. This is war. It won't end until, it's, uh, until one side is uh, totally defeated, and I don't think that's going to be the United States. We're talking about four planes hijacked, even the Pentagon itself attacked. This has to represent a gross failure, 
of U.S. intelligence, doesn't it? Well, of course it represents an intelligence failure, but once again, our homeland defense cannot start at our shores. And I would say that this is more a consequence of 25 years of weak policies, uh, political policies against terrorist sponsoring countries and against terrorist organizations. To what extent will this impact on current American defense priorities? The, the U.S. right now is gearing up to spend billions and billions and billions on a missile defense system which might not work when we've just seen low-flying commercial airliners strike at the heart of America. I think what you've seen is the end of missile defense. There's certainly a slowing down of that program in favor of homeland defense right now. I think uh, many of the billions that went, were going to go to the so-called Star Wars uh, program are now going to be diverted by Congress and, and, and the public in this country who, who are going to demand protection here at home. Given the intensity of public feeling that will flow from this, is there a risk that it will hinder clear thinking in how America responds? Uh, the U.S. is never going to be the same again. This is, uh, uh, it's going to change the way we get on planes in the future. It's going to change our, the way we view the world and even our security here at home. And it's going to be a vastly changed society if we do not take the steps right now to ensure that uh, we deal with the problem forcefully and effectively. The worst thing that could happen is for many of the American people to think that we, we did not deal with this problem uh, appropriately. Neil Livingston, thanks for talking with us. Thank you. As the world rethinks the frightening capacity of international terrorism, Queensland's Premier Peter Beatty says he's determined to continue with plans for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Brisbane in early October. Although some Queenslanders are calling for Chogham to be abandoned because of the threat of violence in the heart of their capital, Peter Beattie says the meeting must go on in the name of democracy. The Premier joins us now live from Brisbane. Peter Beattie, I suppose the reaction of some people there, some residents there, might be understandable given the images coming out of uh, New York and Washington today. But has there been any suggestion at the official level that uh, there might be a rethink going on about the wisdom of holding Chogham? No, Kerry, there hasn't. I think it is understandable that some people would be concerned about these matters, bearing in mind what's happened in the US. But the bottom line here is very simple. If we cancel meetings like Chogham, where do you stop? What that simply means is that terrorism wins. And we can't allow terrorism to win, because what happens next? Do we can cancel the, the parliaments of Australia, the, the parliaments of Britain, the parliaments of, of other countries, the Congress? I mean, if terrorism doesn't see clearly that democracies are prepared to fight and to stand by their institutions, then it's all over. I mean, the, the fact is, the democracies are like a very fragile flower. You've got to give them sunshine. If you hide them away, then that's the beginning of the end. It's that simple. And one of the most important things, Kerry, about democracies is the right of people to meet, particularly elected representatives, to discuss problems and solve them. If you lose that, then you start down that terrible road of an end to democracy. Have you been in contact with Canberra and, for that matter, the Commonwealth uh, about any extra measures that might need to be taken? Well, two things. I had a discussion today with John Anderson, the acting Prime Minister, and I assured him of the, of the Queensland Government's support for a continuation of the uh, holding of Chogham here. We had a meeting of the Chogham organisation, the federal body here, with state police and our state people. Yes, those bodies agreed that it would be business as usual. So the preparation is continuing. And Kerry, let me tell you this, just before I did this interview, I left the meeting of almost 700 volunteers. Those 700 volunteers are people who are volunteering to help at Chogham. Now, they turned up, no one withdrew today, and as I said to them when I addressed them, I said they are great.